Uh, yes, uh, I thank you very much for uh, the opportunity. I uh, uh, have changed slightly the subject. It's still history, it's still far enough. Um, and um, it's um, uh, instead of John Law, which is a bit too controversial a uh, topic, I would say. Um, and uh, I prefer to talk about something that is a little safer also. Um, now, uh, doing work in history, let me introduce a little the context first. And uh, so what I will do is, uh, instead of speculating about other people's work and history, I will talk about uh, my own stuff uh, in uh, work in economic history. Now, uh, it's in the context of a general agenda where I'm interested in uh, the history of public finance uh, since uh, public finance exists. And uh, uh, one episode which is particularly interesting is um, the English debt and the public finance in general in uh, England in the 18th century. Um, now, <clears throat> this work there is actually uh, within its ongoing work that includes uh, Spain, France, and England from the 16th to the 18th century. Uh, there is, just as an aside comment, a lot of relation or a lot of similarity between what happened in Spain in the second half of the 16th century and what happened in the US recently. Um, but sticking to England, so why is this period particularly interesting? Because uh, it is uh, a period where capital market developed in England. And uh, England is developed the capital market in the 18th century after the Glorious Revolution. Uh, it was behind the Netherlands, uh, and also, but with earlier institutions behind uh, that came before, the Italian cities, and uh, Spain. Now, what I learned, at least from the work there, was that institutions do matter, and I was especially interested also in uh, the relation between markets, people, and politics. It seems that there is some relation between all these things. So it's history. So first of all, we should all relax because it's going to be very easy to understand. And uh, second, we, uh, it's going to involve a little more than just uh, economics. So I concentrate particularly on two episodes in uh, 1737 and 1749, which I will explain. Now, the context of the 18th century, which is particularly interesting, and to some extent the reason we talk right now in English instead of French, is, uh, has to do with what happened in that century. Um, so it was a strong rivalry between uh, France and England that eventually England won. Um, and uh, the financial side of these wars uh, was particularly important. I will not comment on this, just give you this background to compare the military expenditures uh, between France and England. And you can see that it's really a good match between the, uh, these four wars that we see here. Uh, we do not have on this diagram the wars uh, during the revolution, the French Revolution, I mean, and uh, the Napoleonic Wars, which are even bigger. So it's the context of the rivalry there. So in England, um, what we have is we have an initial period, which I will skip, but I will present that in context. The paper I will deal with is going to be with the episodes in 37 and 49, and that's what I have here. And so just to put that in context, so this is from, this is 1700, and this is uh, 1800 that we have there, so we have the whole century. Uh, you can see that this is the interest rate, that we have the long-term interest rate on the English debt, 
And so you can see that we have a decline, here a gradual decline. Initially, it's relatively high. The top of the diagram is at 10 percent. And so this period of decline that we have there has been called by Dixon the financial revolution. Financial revolution. So during that time, the institution develops, the market, financial market develops. And you have to keep in mind that at that time, the financial market is the market for the public debt. There is hardly any market for private firms. So the, it's really the dominant part of the market that we have there. So institutions develop there, and eventually 3% interest rate is what you have here. It goes up gradually here, and each bump here is, corresponds to a war, obviously, what you have there. Um, so what I will focus on, uh, I will talk about, of course, uh, 1737, and I will focus especially on what happens after the war of the Austrian succession that we have there. Now, the type of loans that we have in uh, the, uh, during this war is, there is a summary here on this picture that we have there. And uh, you can see that on the blue line here, so here what we have here is the year in uh, what we have there. Uh, actually, this is not really the year. This is, uh, uh, these are months that we have there. So each block that we see here corresponds to a year in what we have there. And so the last one here is uh, 49, 8, 7, 6, and uh, here we go back. So each one of those years that we have there. Um, here we have the price of the 3% annuity in what we have there. So it's an annuity that pays a 3% coupon. I will describe a little of that. And here you have the amount of loans that are issued uh, each time, uh, each for each year uh, of the war that we have there. Uh, that table, I will uh, not forget the details, but just to keep in mind of what type of instruments that we consider, uh, we have here 3% and here we have 4% that you can see that. Some of the details there really do not matter. Uh, so basically what matters here is the type of uh, financial instruments, the type of uh, government debt that was issued is a 3% annuity and a 4% annuity. There is a little life annuity, but that's really, uh, you can neglect that. Now, all these annuities are going to be redeemable annuity. So it means they can be converted uh, at par. So that's what we have for England after 1730. Um, even before that, we do have some of these annuities. Um, that means that um, the uh, annuity can be paid back uh, at its face value. Um, and so the, uh, one of the superiority that England had over France was uh, that England had this type of financial instruments. Uh, in France, there was not one loan that used redeemable annuities in the 18th century, although there were some of, so, some loans that issued uh, redeemable annuities in the previous century. Actually, this is one of the interesting puzzles that we have for the financial markets in France and England. Uh, this regression that we have in the case of France, and that probably is due to uh, the John Law uh, crash, and that has to do with people and so on, but again, that's uh, a big agenda of research that certainly I cannot touch here. So, the question is, in peacetime, when we have the interest rate that goes down, so the price of the bond goes up, and uh, so if eventually the price is more than uh, 3%, then the government can pay back a face value. Now, so there are two ways to do that. One way is to uh, simply use the flow, so to use the surplus, and so during peacetime, there is a small surplus. 
And then you can simply, by lottery, you pick up some of the loans, and then you pay them at face value. That's one thing. The other thing is, yes. Yes, you have a lottery. OK, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so that's, uh, yeah, exactly. So that's what you have. So, I mean, by the way, people loved lotteries at the time, also for issuing loans, but that's uh, a different thing, OK? So that's, so that's one thing. Now, the other thing is to, uh, to uh, pay the stock, to convert the entire stock, uh, like you, you refinance a mortgage. And uh, so when you refinance a mortgage, you uh, take another loan at the lower interest rate. So that's exactly the same thing. But uh, when you go to the bank, you are small compared to the bank. When the government goes to, the, uh, to refinance, it's big compared to the investors. So it's just the other way around. And uh, so that's, and everything there is going to be about uh, this refinancing of the stock of the debt. Um, yes. So what we have is there is a, a kind of a game that takes place uh, to refinance the debt. So you can refinance only through a new loan. Uh, but that new loan, it turns out that, well, the holders of the old loans and the new loans obviously are going to be the same people. So there is, well, number one, before doing that, it requires like floating uh, a new stock and so on. It requires some collaboration of the people who are involved in the market, especially at that time, institutional uh, institutions like the Bank of England that represented bondholders and uh, a large fraction of the debt was intermediated by the Bank of England that represented the bondholders. Uh, the uh, good side, the advantage of doing that has been uh, described by uh, North, Weingast and others so that the people would be, uh, uh, have some kind of market power against the government, against default. My view about these redemptions later on is uh, quite the opposite, actually, uh, that the government was more acting in the interest of the people than uh, people at large than the Bank of England that certainly re represented its uh, bondholders, but that's much more the population than the people. Um, so what we have is these, uh, since the new and the old bondholders are going to be the same, well, why go through this? kind of expensive exercise that we have to issue a new loan and so on. These are going to be the same people anyway. So instead, the method is to lower the interest rate. So you lower the interest rate, and that's actually what got me interested in, in that initially. And so typically, you will reduce the interest rate from 4% to 3%. You saw that these interest rates that were, uh, these loans were at 3 and 4. And so you want to reduce the interest rate from 4 to 3. But you see, you cannot decide by decree to reduce the interest rate from 4 to 3, because that's a default. So you must have a cash option. That means that when there is an interest reduction that is taking place, then there is a subscription. And people have to sign up for that. And if the subscription doesn't go through, then, uh, sorry, if the subscription goes through and they have not subscribed, then they will simply get the face value. So that's what will happen. And the people who subscribe, when if the subscription goes through, they will, reserve, they, will re, they will get the terms of the subscription. Now, if the subscription fails, Tell you the truth, I don't quite know exactly what happens. Um, that's the, uh, the reason is because I will see the events. It never came to that point. I mean, the subscription failed um, in the first case that I will consider. But in order to measure the cost of that, it's, uh, there is no data for that. I will explain that. So what we have is basically a game. Um, 
what you have uh, quickly are some values here. Suppose that X is the fraction of the Asians who subscribe. So you have a six month period to subscribe. Then there is a smaller, smallest amount which is undetermined, but it is somewhere. A minimum amount for the subscription, subscription to be successful. You see, it doesn't have to be that everyone has to sub subscribe. Suppose it's a, well, let's say a 10 million uh, conversion. If let's say nine people, nine million people subscribe, then for the remaining one million, the government can issue a new loan or whatever, so these people can be paid off. But there must be some level that is fairly close to the total amount for the conversion to be successful. And so uh, take the prices of the 3% and the 4% bonds, uh, P and Q there. In addition, there is some premium that can be zero, but uh, it can also be positive for the people who subscribe. For example, if there is a conversion, they can receive, let's say, a higher interest rate for a few years or, and so on. So there is an additional premium that can be uh, granted. And now you can see that here what we have eventually is there are two things that you can do. You can either subscribe or do not subscribe. Now, if critical mass is reached, then the sub subscription takes place. And if you have signed up, then you will get, what do you get? The conversion is basically, uh, so you will get the 3% annuity. That's what you will get because the interest rate is reduced from four to three. So basically your four becomes a three and you get some premium in addition. And you can see that obviously if you're sure that it's going to be successful, well, provided P is sufficiently high, which is an important thing, obviously an H, then this is, great. This is obviously going to be an equilibrium. Now, if the subscription is not successful, then, well, you do not subscribe, then you get basically uh, still, you are in your 4% bond, so that's what you get. And you get something here which is less than that, which again, it's, uh, if you subscribe, it's probably the cost of going to subscribe and so on. So anyway, there is some minor cost associated with that. So if P plus H is greater than 100, then, well, we have two equilibria that we have there. But obviously, uh, it can go either way. And uh, that's what I look at the data later on. So the first event is in 1737. And uh, it's, um, uh, so these are the prices. So here what we have is the price of the 3% annuity. Here we have the price of the uh, 4% annuity. And uh, here you have some prices that are there. So notice that there are two prices, so two lines that are important. Actually, the line 100 is more important, but anyway. So what we have here is uh, 105, which is the price of the 3%. And 110 at that time is uh, the price of the 4%. So at that time, um, there was a proposal made that was in March of 1737 to reduce the interest rate because that was, after all, the right of the government. So the proposal is made in Parliament. That's the way it goes. And there's a discussion in Parliament about that. So that happened. There is a long speech, and uh, Barna made uh, the move for that. And that was proposed at that time. Now, you can notice, uh, and the proposal that he made was a strict application of the terms. So that means that the H was zero at the time, and the P was uh, 100. So not 100, it was really P. So it was really the price of the 3% uh, annuity. There were other terms proposed for other reasons, but these are details which do not matter here. Anyway, you can see that given this price data that we have there, uh, if at the time when the speech was made, if the policy would be implemented, the holder of the 4% would suffer a capital loss that would be uh, of five that you have there. You can see in this diagram, by the way, I didn't say that, but this is fairly obvious, is so this is a 4% coupon against a 3% coupon. So you can see that uh, the gap that we have there, take the, the year that we have there, so it's five here. So five represents 
and that's what the same thing in the uh, it's a pretty simple thing. Five represents the expected value of getting the coupon of four instead of three. That's uh, the difference between the two. So everybody is aware that the 4% is redeemable. Hmm? The 4% that you have there is not at one third mark up compared to the 3%. So people know that it's going to be redeemable at some point, and so the, uh, the gap between the two obviously measures the expectation. That's actually what the paper is about. But at the time when the speech was made, then you, uh, they would have suffered an unexpected, because obviously that represents the expectation, so they would have suffered an unexpected loss of five. Well, there was a violent reaction, and that's why I think that these things are made in connection. It's not just market like that. It's obviously a political decision. It's decided in parliament. People have friends. They intervene. And uh, they try to do something against uh, such a policy. So they try to keep to preserve their higher coupon. Um, my suspicion, although, and this is what the editor let me write, but uh, it would have to be checked in uh, the archives, the minutes of the Bank of England. Obviously, that move was strongly opposed by the Bank of England, the South Sea Company, and the institutions that were holding a large fraction of the public debt. So what we see here is you can see this collapse here that we have there, here. And this is, uh, well, uh, so the decrease that we have the day after that speech was made. The speech was made on a Tuesday, that is on a Wednesday. Uh, this, uh, the prices there are daily prices. The uh, market was meeting every day, uh, including Saturday. And so you can see that this is the 3% that would decrease this way suddenly. And the other thing would uh, decrease also, but they decrease only because the 3% decreases. The difference between this 4% annuity and the 3% does not really change very much. So um, the 3% was not at all the matter of the policy. This was totally irrelevant for the policy that was announced. It was not touching the 3%. So my suspicion is that some agents simply manipulated the market and reduced the 3%, the price of the 3%, to 1 or 2, but obviously it could be reduced even more. And so when you go back to the matrix that you have there, if now you have an H that is equal to zero and a P that is close to 100, it's going to shift the equilibrium towards the non-subscription. So now the way it goes, obviously, is that people do not go up to the point where they will play the game. They will uh, discuss that in Parliament. They will see what will happen. There is a power game that takes place there and to see whether that has a chance of success or not. And that is deliberated and so on. And that goes on for a few weeks. There is a final vote whether to go on with that or not. And the vote rejected the proposal. So that is how this, uh, subscription, this conversion there failed. Next war. Next war is the, well, before it was hardly a war, it was peacetime. So this is now the war of the Austrian succession. And uh, so again, it's the same diagram. As you can see, uh, this is where you have a one-third markup. If you think that the 3% is not redeemable. Now, by the way, if you think that the 4% is not redeemable. By the way, the 3%, uh, I treat it as redeemable because uh, actually, uh, well, this is hindsight, but the next redemption uh, of the 3% to 2.5% uh, happened at the end of the 19th century. So that's certainly a long time uh, after that. Uh, and there are other reasons why we can treat that as uh, not redeemable at the time. Anyway, so that's what you see here. Um, and especially uh, what happens in uh, 1748, what we have there, uh, where the peace negotiations started on a weekend between uh, March 21st and uh, uh, March 23rd. You can have a jump there that you can see immediately. Um, and so the markup, what you have there, the, I mean, all the red uh, crosses are uh, for the year of 1747. And um, uh, so that reflects the expectation 
that people had at the time about the future uh, redemption of these um, bonds that you can see. Now, what you can see here is gradually, as the 3% uh, uh, increased in price, so when interest rate went down, so the interest rate goes down, so we go here up to 100 here, which means that the long-term interest rate is 3%. Okay? And now we see here is the uh, price of the 4% is what we have there. Now, some at least, that's the way, well, historians, typically Dixon, who has worked quite a lot on that, um, will say that, at least, well, looking his, at his evidence, is that in the, in the winter of uh, 1750, <coughs> the negotiation between the institutions and the government were touch and go. Uh, well, that's not my view. Uh, my view, according to the market which is here, is that, as you can see here in October of uh, before, the market had completely integrated and thought that it was 100% sure that the conversion would take place. Uh, why? Because at that time, the terms of the conversion that were, by the way, announced uh, before, it was precisely not to take people by surprise the way we have there, it was certainly to try to not surprise people, to keep a political support for that. And it was announced at the time that the premium that would be uh, given at the time of uh, the conversion would be precisely an equivalent of four. So precisely we see here a gap, which is one of four up there. So we see that here. And you can see this is what we see in October of 49. And after that, this is before the announcement. After that, although it was public, what would the, the plan would be, you can see that, well, of course, the long-term interest rate is changing, the 100 that we have there. But now, the two prices are moving in such a way that the difference between the 4 and the 3% are constant at 4 that we have there. So it's really what people anticipated that this would be a sure event uh, that we have there. Um, so, well, as I said, here we move to the equilibrium where, uh, in that case, here this number here is, uh, what we have is 104, okay, what we have there. Um, now, there is some, something more that can be extracted from uh, this uh, previous figure that we have there. Um, at some point on this diagram, I even had... Uh, uh, kind of a black shoes model for the year 49, but the editor uh, cut that out. So, um, but still, one can have some uh, test which is rougher than that. So the question is, is the, well, it's related to an issue that has been addressed uh, during this uh, workshop. And uh, the uh, issue is, do markets fluctuate widely. Uh, so here is, does the uh, price of these bonds fluctuate too widely uh, during the war? Is the price of the bond too low during the war? Does, do people underestimate the capacity of the government to redeem the debt? Hmm? Do they uh, think that redemption is going to, or the conversion is going to take place far off in the future? So using this diagram here, which basic, basic intuition is that the difference between the two is the discount, expected discounted value of the premium coupon of the 4% before the redemption. So what you can do is you can simply, well, so the difference between the two prices, the expected value of this additional coupon during the time, the random uh, T that we have there using the interest rate there, and making some reasonable assumption given the, what we have there, which is basically before the redemption, the interest rate is higher than uh, some long-term value at which time the redemption takes place. Redemption takes place when the price, and when you see what people discuss at the time, this is how they think, when the, uh, interest, when the price of the 3% is stabilized. Well, that means basically 100. Uh, so that's the reason what takes this value P star to be 100. Um, the interest rate there to be 3% three per in what we have there. You can find under the assumption that before reaching this value, all these values have to be higher. 
and that's sufficient for this to have a lower bound of the uh, time that people anticipate uh, it will take for the redemption. And so we can draw using this uh, thing there, there's an equation where we have uh, the low key of the points. Uh, here, for example, at this, on this line here, people anticipate that the redemption, the conversion is not, not under the term that would take place eventually. Uh, it would not take place before 20 years. Okay, you can see the redemption took place in 50, 1750. Here we are just uh, basically, uh, well, two and a half years before. Uh, here we are basically one year before, and you can see that people overestimate way too much the time that it will take uh, for the government to uh, redeem the debt. So that means basically the, uh, the interest rate there, I mean, is uh, the long term interest rate is way too high compared to what it should be uh, given the recovery that would take place. Um, so it's another indication of an overreaction of this. And by the way, of course, this type of thing uh, of excess expectations. A reaction of expectation enabled the government to play on that. So basically, the government was able to issue these 4% bonds with a premium here that was uh, significantly in excess to what eventually the government had to pay. Actually, there is some relation between this kind of event and what happened uh, to Margaret Thatcher and the inflation index bonds in the 80s, although the context is somewhat different. So anyway, so this is some uh, illustration of the type of relation that there can be between markets and uh, the uh, actually uh, the politics that go behind that and the evolution and uh, of these markets over the 18th century thank you